so I now have a real honor in introducing Ambassador Sasai, the Japanese ambassador to the United States. He's a well-known figure here uh, at CSIS. He's very generous with his time and insights, and we really appreciate that. He's been a great representative of Japan here in the U.S. for about 18 months or so now, and uh, hopefully for much, much longer. Um, you have his biographical information, and you'll see all of his uh, achievements. I always like to stress two things about Ambassador Sasai. Uh, one of which is that he has a distinguished background in economic affairs uh, at the Foreign Ministry, including being the Director General for Economic Affairs, and that's important to me as an economics guy in a foreign policy uh, environment. Um, so he brings real credibility on those issues. Um, and the other thing I always stress is that he's not afraid to speak his mind. Um, he's a good diplomat, so he'll always be careful, but he, he also, you know, he also tells the things the way he sees them. And that's, uh, that's a terrific, terrific uh, attribute in, uh, in an official like him. So we really appreciate his being here and look forward to his remarks. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Sasai. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mashura, uh, for kind introduction. Uh, uh, this morning, I believe that you had uh, extensive discussions on Japanese economy and technology and so forth. So I don't want to repeat the same stuff you had already heard. But, uh, and you are eating at this moment, so you might feel like uh, taking a nap rather than uh, <laughs> listening to me. But, um, you know, uh, I, um, I recognize the presence of uh, uh, Dr. Hugh Patrick, uh, who is a good friend of ours, and uh, I always treasure uh, his presence and opinions about Japan, and also Mr. Ichikawa, and, uh, uh, who do a great work uh, uh, for uh, the, uh, uh, the Maghreb and high-tech high uh, advancement. But uh, this seminar uh, is a very interesting one. And the title of the seminar is uh, 1964, uh, Back to the Future. And most of you have probably seen uh, the movie called Back to the Future. And as you may recall, the Doc Brown's uh, time machine car had to get up to 88 miles uh, per hour before it could break into the time travel dimension. At one point, uh, Marty McFly said to Doc, hey Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough road to get up to 88. And Doc Brown says, where we are going, we don't need roads. Perhaps some of you remember all these you know, exchanges. But um, you know, countries, do need roads and roadmap, obviously. <laughs> now, we can't uh, move forward without roads and roadmap. We can't uh, put ourselves on this uh, you know, uh, car, go to the future dimension. But back in 1964, Japan had a roadmap. In 1964, Japan joined the OECD, the Shinkansen, the world's uh, first high-speed train began operation and we held the Tokyo Olympics. And these were a turning point in the post-war post period. Uh, Japan was rebuilding and returning to the international community. Now, 50 years later, rather than OECD, Japan is focused on TPP. Some people might think that this is sad, but uh, we think this is a great thing to do. Rather than Shinkansen, we have the Maghreb now in visit. This doesn't mean that we get rid of Shinkansen. Shinkansen is still great, but we are looking into new one now. And rather than 1964 uh, Tokyo Olympics, we are planning for the 2020 Olympics. So it really is back uh, to the future in some ways. And I think it is good to stop once in a while at occasions like this. And I uh, appreciate the progress and accomplishment of those who have gone before. And uh, this is a good time for 
for us to reflect what has done, what we need to do more uh, to sustain our own future. But uh, we all know that there are lots of questions uh, we need to ask. Have we had uh, lost decades? Uh, have we had uh, entrenched ways and traditions that limit the speed of change and improvement? Have we uh, experienced a political turnover? And at the same time, political lethargy? The answer is obvious, yes, we have. But here is the important point. The foundation of Japan is solid. And most people I know, experts, uh, political leaders, average citizens, believe Japan can rise about the obstacles in front of us, whether demographic, economic, cultural, and political. And I want to focus on several areas where I see reason for this optimism. Let's start with economics and more specifically, urbanomics. I think that you debated on economic urbanomics this morning. Um, but uh, I don't know uh, whether you saw that article on Japanese reform in last week's uh, Economist. And, but I thought it was uh, uh, quite interesting. And the article started telling the well-known story of the Meiji Restoration, which in a little over 10 years reshaped Japan uh, from top to bottom. The economists noted that last year, Prime Minister Abe shut off the first two hours of Abenomics uh, with, quote, a major speed, quite rapid speed. Then it went, to say, went on to say, quote, this week, Mr. Abe is back with a proper third hour. Part of its strength is its breadth. It is a less single arrow than a hundred strong bundle of acupuncture needles, unquote. The economist says of the reform, quote, together all this represent a coherent vision of a more innovative and globally minded society, unquote. So as you know, there is a quite a good assessment. And uh, you might uh, think that economists often the case is very cynical about the economic policy of Japan, even uh, some security policy. But this time, economists is giving us a quite uh, a good score on what's happening in Japanese economic policy making. So uh, let me just uh, go through, uh, just in case you could reconfirm what is now going on. And as you know, the plan called for several things, and cutting the corporate tax rate from 35.6% to somewhere in the 20s over the next three years. This is on top of this uh, April 2.4% cut. Someone asked me the other day, why uh, not put an exact number on that? Well, like uh, 25%, why the 20s, you know? Well, politics like diplomacy is not an exact science, as you know. I think the prime minister is waiting to see what he can get through. He also has proposal for health care and pension reform, specifically revising the asset mix of the government pension investment fund, the largest pension fund in the world, $1.2 trillion. I don't know how much stocks they will buy or not. I can't tell. If I would say that, I have to resign, possibly. So I wouldn't tell it. But we expect that they will be more energized market there. And also in the third hour are various agricultural reforms, including the first ever reform of agricultural cooperative. And I hope that would also make Japanese, each and individual agriculture cooperative more active, independent, to usher in more market principles 
in, in Japan. Now, for Fahrenheit, sometimes read the local real estate uh, listings. I saw an ad uh, the other day for a farm in Virginia. Uh, what got my attention is that the farm had been in the same family since the uh, 1700. Farming is very often an occupation of tradition, especially in Japan. Uh, and something is done a certain way because uh, it has always been done this way. That is not so much the case in the United States uh, with the big corporate farms, with fence row to fence row, planting and harvesting by GPS. So although the United States answered uh, this question, it has not yet been answered in Japan in full and gigantic way. And that question is how do you turn agriculture into a growth industry? For many years, Japanese thought that agriculture is something we need to defend all the time from the foreign competition. But for the first time, people are getting serious to make our agriculture uh, industry, to make our agriculture more productive, uh, competing even with American product. It is a very big dream, but I think uh, there was decision taken that uh, we would start it again. Let us see how this will be looking like after 20 and 30 years. Around the time I come to this town, I might be telling you all, you that uh, dream came to be true. This is not really going back to the future, but this is a great thing to see. But uh, these are the things. And, and, but the question is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, how do you turn agriculture into a growth industry? Uh, or another question, how does Japan provide for its food security? Uh, you know, when the average age of Japanese farmer is 70, and the children have not much desire uh, to be in a small plot of land. Of course, these days, there are some younger generations who are willing to do uh, agriculture. Uh, for some years back, there was a pessimism about the younger generation to do agriculture. But we see more and more, even younger generations are interested in agriculture. So there is a sign of uh, having good younger generation to the uh, agriculture. I think that's what the policy matters. And that's what the prime minister is trying to do and what uh, we expect that will be successful. Now, as you know, uh, the new proposal also called uh, for encouraging women uh, to enter workforce and bringing in more falling workers. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke at the uh, Womenomics uh, Conference on Capitol Hill. As some of you uh, might have been there. I uh, think what a challenge this is itself, uh, you know, uh, uh, represent uh, uh, for a Japanese ambassador to be out giving speech on a topic, you know, that was not on radar screen just a few years ago. And then consider that a Japanese prime minister now actively promotes women's economic empowerment. In fact, he places womenomics at the core of uh, his growth strategy. We must address the issue of women in the workplace if we are to unleash the power of women. And that is what uh, proposals on encouraging women's workplace participation, including uh, new after-school facilities and looking at tax and benefit incentives. And these are what they're all about, and these are very important policy instruments uh, Prime Minister is willing to go through. Last September, Prime Minister Abe declared uh, to the world that he intend to create a, a society in which women shine. And what is now very clear is that Japan's economy won't shine unless Japanese women shine. I see here uh, some Japanese uh, women participating uh, this uh, gathering. Uh, 10 or 20 years ago, 
We didn't see much uh, women coming to this gathering, possibly. Even here in Washington, we see more Japanese women working. If you look at the uh, chief bureau of the Japanese mass media, there are three chief bureau. They are women. It's a great thing to see. You know. So um, if we could speed up this process, not only one or two years, five, 10 years, I'm sure that there will be uh, more women to be in the forefront of the uh, advancement of the society. Well, the Prime Minister's uh, proposal contains other reforms uh, in the labor market. Japan often worked long hours, but to what end? And are uh, those uh, productive hours? Uh, back in the uh, 1990s, uh, when I was uh, director for American Desk, we are negotiating uh, uh, with American counterpart, uh, structural uh, issues here and that. Then we were told that the Japanese, we know that Japanese work pretty hard, long hours. Well, not necessarily always efficiently. You know, that was good and bad to hear, as you know. So it was good. We need to have uh, more creative hours uh, for men and women working hard but very efficiently. Uh, Silicon Valley startups would feel con constrained uh, bringing their work culture to Japan because of the regulations. I think this has been addressed for some years, but uh, we couldn't do it. Now, for the first time, Prime Minister is trying to change uh, some of the constraints. And um, people are beginning to realize the importance of uh, work-life balance. And uh, it's not always good to work late at night and show to your superior that uh, you are working hard all the time. And you need to show the result rather than the length of uh, uh, you know, work time. And so people began to realize that uh, we need flexibility and the companies also need the flexibility. So Japan needs more varied and flexible work practices, and that is what the Prime Minister seeks to address. Now, beyond these measures for economic growth, let me come to the second reason. Uh, Japan uh, will progress over the next 50 years. And um, as it has over the last 50 years, and that is uh, advanced technology. This subject, also you people are discussed this morning, but once again, uh, I will repeat, back in 1964, Shinkansen was the world's first high-speed train. And uh, I was a country boy. You know, I didn't know much about all this high-speed uh, train. I didn't know Tokyo either, you know, up until high school. The first time I went to Tokyo, I took this uh, Shinkansen. It was a dream tr trip to me. But now, six hour trip between Tokyo and Osaka uh, was cut to three hours, which in turn supported Japan's economic growth. In my children days, my father told me after coming back from Tokyo, it was um, 17 hours, he said. You know, change the train, going up and down. So we have come a long way. It's not only three years, uh, three hours from Tokyo to Osaka, even to Okayama, where I was born. And um, Japan's other technological advances also supported growth, as you know, uh, in the uh, electrical appliance, the automobile, the semiconductor, and other industries. Although these days, and, uh, you know, all these semiconductor industries and so forth were relegated to other emerging economies, we know, but uh, the, that's, uh, that's inevitable. Uh, you know, in every country, there is a different cycle of development. So we need to go further advanced. Uh, uh, we, uh, you know, this uh, semiconductor continue to be important, but obviously we have to move ahead beyond that. 
So uh, this Margrave, they are planning to uh, begin building a Margrave line between Tokyo and Nagoya this year, as we all know, possibly. <laughs> the Prime Minister called uh, this a dream technology. And it's very interesting in introducing it uh, uh, in the United States Northeast Corridor, which would be a game changer for the region. And he had been promoting the Margrave uh, to President Obama with the speeds up to 311 miles per an hour, it would be possible uh, to shorten the trip between D.C. and New York City from six hours to two hours. The great thing is that this uh, environmentally friendly technology revitalized city. It's not simply making the traffic speedy and you know, let the people move fast. But when you set up the lines, there'll be uh, cities in between, and there'll be a huge opportunity for getting all the business, including service industries and so forth. So this would revitalize the cities, societies around them, and the economy. Even though Japan has been a slum for the past two decades, and great new technology have arisen during this period. When the president was in Japan recently, most of uh, you probably saw uh, the photo of him uh, taking, uh, talking to robot. I was there and watching him, and he was uh, you know, kicking a soccer ball uh, at this robot, and, I, uh, and he was uh, trying to be nice to robot, as he was trying to everybody else around there. But uh, the point is that um, you know, the, this tech, these technologies go beyond robots uh, to uh, big data, to environmental energy, water treatment, you name it. So um, great things are happening. And, uh, this uh, surprises most Americans, but in 2012, Japan had more patents uh, granted than any nation in the world. 343,484 patents. Well, this is a meticulous number, but uh, that is uh, like money in the bank for the future. It's great to see that. The last thing I want to talk about is Japan's leadership in the world. Back in 1964, we had the Tokyo Olympics, as I said it, to show that we had risen above the desperate situation in which the war had left us. So when we go and think back, this Tokyo Olympic was more or less the starting point of our growth after the war. But uh, as you know, Jap Japan was still trying to uh, catch up uh, with the rest of the world not just economically, but also in terms of being a leader in the society of nations. Japan received funds from World Bank to build Shinkansen. So we had a great technology, but we never forget that we are supported, helped by the others. And that's what we need to remember when we think about the future. We did our own but not simply by our own. We were supported by the others. Now, we are, as you know, a large donor to the World Bank. Last week, I went to a signing ceremony at the World Bank for IDA, the International Development Association. Japan's total contribution to IDA is the second largest among all donors countries after the United States. So 50 years later, Japan is expanding its sense of how to contribute more as a nation. We can do this through a strong economy, through advances in technology, through our contribution to organizations like the World Bank, and we can do it through being a good ally. When President Obama was in Tokyo, he voiced strong support, U.S. support, of Japan's right of uh, collective self-defense. For nearly 70 years, 
We have been a democratic, peace-loving nation. The government of Japan believes that by developing a more solid security structure that gives us the flexibility to respond to the future challenge, peace and stability will be strengthened, I'm sure. There was a good decision that you know uh, taken by Abe cabinet, Abe government this week uh, to introduce a new security orientation, uh, you know, introducing this uh, collective defense for Japan. We are uh, ready uh, to uh, play an even larger and more responsible leadership role in Asia and beyond, including arena of the security. Uh, it is our common interest for Japan to be the best ally possible of the United States. And this new orientation exactly envisages that objective and that we are ready to do that together with the United States. Now, let me uh, start bringing this uh, to a close. Back in 1964, it was a good year uh, for the Beatles uh, with the number one song of the year, uh, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. The, by the way, this is my uh, wife's favorite song. Uh, she was chasing Beatles in high school days. But, but it was a good year for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals, which won the World Series at the time, and it was a good year for Japan. So in fact, the last 50 years have been good ones for Japan. We are determined to see that continue. We are determined to use Japan's economic and technological strengths to help the rest of the world. And one thing is much stronger today than in 1964 in our sense of who we are. Japan and the United States share a vision to lead the effort toward global stability and order into the next half century. And that is why what I came here to affirm. So thank you for inviting me and thank you for your kind attention. Are you willing to stay up and take a couple yeah. of questions? Uh, so thank you very much, Ambassador Sasai. Wonderful capstone to our event and a really clear and comprehensive presentation. We really uh, appreciate that. Uh, Ambassador Sasai is willing to take a couple of questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, again, wait for the microphone and identify yourself and uh, we will, um, we will uh, be happy to answer questions. Okay, Jeannie, you've had two questions today, but I'll give you a third, okay, go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador. My name is Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I remember last time when Prime Minister Abe was here in CSIS at the other office, he said, Japan is back. So yeah. thank you, welcome back. And I um, thank Japan for taking the leadership in the Asia Pacific. Uh, so I will ask you two questions regarding the TPP and also regarding the role of Japan in the region, in the area. The TPP, Vietnam is also a member of the TPP, and I'm very happy that Japan is joining. So you think that we will come to conclusion uh, sometime this year and next year to push the regional prosperity forward. Mm -hmm. I hope that Japan will take the leadership in that. Mm -hmm. And I congratulate you for talking about the agriculture industry, yeah. because that will be tremendous. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question I'm asking is about the regional security and you mentioned that Japan is ready to go, to move beyond, mm. to take the leadership, to protect, sustain mm. the security in the area. Mm. So we're asking if Japan would join ASEAN to enforce mm. the international law mm. in the sea, especially the unclosed, and if we ever have the COC side, would Japan help to support mm. and enforce? The enforcement is important. And to that, I have asked if Japan would Propose to have a seat at the UN Security Council. Mm. I have asked that many at many different leaders, and I the other day I think it was yesterday at the Heritage Foundation I raised the question: 
to a few leaders in the UN, mm. and they said they have proposed that. Mm. So I would strongly suggest that mm. Mm. Prime Minister Abe mm. uh, move forward and asking for Japan to have a leader. Uh, the, the, the seat at the UN Security Council is important for us, for the Asia Pacific. Mm. Thank you. All right. You have asked many questions. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, start by uh, this TPP. Uh, uh, yes, I think, uh, first of all, let me say this. Uh, uh, this TPP is obviously uh, a great opportunity uh, for the countries in the region, not on the United States and Japan, but the other countries, including ASEAN, and other members. Eventually, uh, uh, this uh, you know, uh, exercise should be uh, you know, merging into wider uh, Asia-Pacific uh, free trade regime. Uh, we welcome China to come in, into orbit as a member of a free trading system. That's what we need when we work on the future uh, you know, regional economic order. But having said that, uh, you know, uh, this, um, this arrangement and a free trade agreement is very strategic in, ma in many ways, not only in terms of um, economic meaning, uh, job and growth and investment, and new rules, but also in the sense that um, people and nations, including Japan and the United States, are committed uh, to the future growth to the future of Asia Pacific. So political message is imp very important. We are not really going back uh, to the protectionist uh, regime, protectionist way. We will continue to make advance to open the country and advance uh, liberalization, although uh, it is always difficult you know, whether it is a domestic political or societal impact. And when you, we try to go for the reform and making problem, there is always resistance in any countries. And so uh, having said it, uh, strategically this is important for the future. And also the Japan-US context. If we are not be able to succeed in getting this TPP uh, taking off, it's a great damage, even to our relationship. I mean, I'm talking about Japan, US. Because, um, you know, President and Japanese Prime Minister, Abe, uh, committed. They said that uh, they would do it. So we need to do it. And that, uh, you know, involves enormous commitment and effort of both parties, if the both government and country could do that together, that's an enormous history-making achievement. In that way, this is very much strategic. That's what I want to say. Now, you were asking, uh, could this be concluded? My answer is yes, we could and we should. And uh, as you know, uh, uh, there is uh, going to be a chief negotiators meeting taking place soon in Canada. Uh, early uh, this month, and I hope uh, that uh, negotiators would work hard day and night and uh, try to uh, close the more or less the uh, chapter. Mm -hmm. We know there are some remaining difficult issues uh, when it comes to rural issues, whether it is intellectual property issues, environment issues, or whatever the issues remaining. Uh, but uh, often the case, you know, uh, the most difficult part is the uh, try to end the uh, game. So we are now coming into that phase, and uh, I hope that uh, the, this agreement uh, uh, should be worked out uh, uh, as soon as possible. And uh, because I think uh, this is not simply uh, the engagement of t trade negotiators. This uh, involves... Uh, whole countries. Now, uh, you are second questions about Japan's role in uh, security and a wider, you know, uh, Asia Pacific and also beyond. Um, I talked about uh, this, uh, you know, introductions of uh, new, uh, uh, new orientation uh, decided by the Prime Minister to make uh, 
ourselves possible to participate in collective defense in, with the countries in close uh, relationship. Uh, it's not defined, you know, specifically, obviously, United States will be a, a foremost uh, possibility of doing that because we have a uh, uh, very vital security arrangement and allies each other. So, uh, and, 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 but I, I have to caution you uh, that uh, when we talk about a greater role and more responsible role, I think uh, we are pretty cautious, to be honest. Uh, you know, uh, uh, when you, you see all this, uh, you know, prime minister's statement, so forth, and there are basically uh, three conditions. One, this has to be a necessary minimum. Number two, uh, this should be mobilized where there is no alternative means. And number three, this is a new one, very important one, is that, uh, you know, um, um, there has to be a clear danger of uh, harming the uh, uh, Japan survival. Uh, so uh, unless uh, the, the, uh, there is a serious situation surrounding us, threatening us, and uh, we are not really, you know, uh, easily uh, uh, sending the force uh, to engage any uh, uh, use of the force. And the Prime Minister said uh, uh, some time ago that uh, he's not really envisioning to send, send troops for fighting uh, in, the, uh, in other countries, you know, uh, like Iraq and other places. So uh, I think um, our step is basically uh, to strengthen the uh, deterrence, no, not really try to, uh, to show off. And it's a very modest one, so that uh, we wouldn't uh, give the wrong impression that uh, we would continue to be stuck uh, with ourselves when there are some uncertainties evolving around us, including uh, some of the increasing threat uh, uh, from North Korea, for example. I don't define the China as a tremendous uh, you know, security issue at this moment. And I have to be careful in, in talking about this one because China is a great country. Great country, we need to have a constructive relationship. At this moment, yes, we have some tensions evolving around Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea or East China Sea. But not that need to be settled and by talking. And I, I, I detect some signs even on the part of China uh, try to, uh, uh, you know, expand its exchanges of communications on various levels, business people and some of the political level. So let us see how uh, this will be going and I, I want to see uh, there will be more dialogue coming so that uh, we could have a better and constructive and peaceful uh, relationship. But uh, in having this one, we have to make sure that uh, there is a rule of law uh, need to be given uh, respect. And uh, you know, uh, the uh, ASEAN, you talk about ASEAN countries, has its own uh, concern, you know, uh, President, uh, uh, expressed his understanding that uh, those countries enabling China has a concern about Chinese uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, economic rise and military reach these days. So uh, putting all this together, I think, uh, yes, there are some uncertainties and things that we are worried about, but that doesn't mean that uh, we have to get into a more serious situation. I think they, uh, uh, throughout the Cold War, uh, you know, there was some conflict and so forth. Basically, we didn't have a very serious uh, arms conflict and so forth. Why not for another 50 years? This is our obligations, the current people, uh, to leave all this region very peaceful way. And, and this is a common interest, I mean, including China. And so uh, and in doing so, I think ASEAN would play a very important role. And we appreciate ASEAN cohesion, ASEAN solidarity, 
ASEAN is rapidly becoming democracy and advancing its uh, you know, middle class people's welfare and so forth. So there is a future. And those things will be a very promising factor uh, when we shape up the future of Asia Pacific. Now, what was your third question? I forgot. Security. Oh, UN Security Council, right. Um, um, yeah, um, this is a very important issue, to be honest. And uh, uh, most of the countries uh, are willing uh, to reform uh, Security Council. Uh, except possibly f uh, for P5, I'd say. Uh, you know, uh, it depends, but uh, the P5 country has its own uh, prerogative and veto, and uh, the, so uh, some of them are afraid that there'll be uh, more uh, members coming in. Uh, it'd be more difficult to reach a decision if they are given veto. There will be more vetoing around. At this moment, it's not, some people criticize it's not really working fully as fully expected because of uh, some of the uh, different views between, for example, US and China and Russia, for example, when it comes to uh, very um, um, essential matters pertaining to individual interests. So it is not easy even at this moment. So the concern is that uh, what would you do if there are more members coming in and there are some this and that proposal? But having said it, I, I want to say that Japan is qualified to be a member of the Security Council. We are not giving up. We continue to advocate the reform of the Security Council. And they need to be adaptive to the re new uh, realities of the world. And uh, only Security Council uh, cannot be out of date, to be honest. But, um, you know, um, this has been on agenda for some time. But uh, the Japan, although willing, uh, to be a part of that. But uh, we have to do our own work, share of the work, um, the economic and development, uh, even democracy, and, and, and even uh, security, as I just mentioned. If uh, people of the nations, I mean, uh, around the world think that Japan will be qualified enough uh, even the, the, all these uh, existing P5 will not be able to resist. That's what we need to do. So we are hoping for it, but still we have to be humble about what role will be given by the world opinion, and we shall go on the road we wish uh, to be the best for that. I, t I told you that he speaks his mind, um, and, uh, and I think that was a really fantastic answer to some complicated questions. We are falling back on Amtrak time here. Um, uh, we're, we're seven minutes past the time we promised we would get you to uh, Osaka Station. Um, so uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here, and, and I would l like everyone to join me, please, in thanking Ambassador Sasai for a fantastic ending to our summit. Thank you. And, 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 and thank you to all of you for, for coming today again on a hot day, and uh, at least it's cool in here, um, and uh, for participating, and, and we really appreciate your, your patience and staying, um, and look forward to the next event, which, as I said, Womenomics in September, it, for my program. So look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye.